I'll just write that down. Minimize. Hello, everybody. We're just going to begin in about a minute here. Um, just got to figure out some technical uh, information, and uh, and then we're going to get going. Ready for me to go? Yeah, let me do a short introduction. I'm just gonna wait. Um, yeah, I'd just like to welcome everybody. We have Molly Fraser here and David Dick um, from the um, uh, from the Wasanich Leadership Council, and um, we're going to hear about uh, seeing as it's um, it's uh, World Whale Day today, and we're trying to. Um, investigate how important whales are to our ecosystems here on southern Vancouver Island and maybe even the world. Um, first of all, I'd like to do a territorial acknowledgement to the Lekwungen speaking peoples, that's the Songhees and the Esquimalt. And um, again, I'll just welcome Molly Fraser and David Dick. So, hi, welcome. Um, I'd like to maybe we could go over, we'll have about 15 minutes for each presentation and I'll try to encourage us to move along if we, if need be, but um, yeah, maybe Molly, are you ready? Would you like to, to begin? Yeah, great. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Molly Fraser and good afternoon. Thanks for uh, having me today. Uh, I love talking about uh, whales, so this is a great opportunity. Um, and I'm currently the marine biologist for the Wasanich Leadership Council. So today I'm just gonna go through a really quick presentation that outlines the overview of orcas, background of the Southern resident killer whales and their family structure. And then I'm going to end on talking about boater education and what you can do to minimize your impact while you're out on the water. So killer whales are large animals. Males can usually grow between 20 to 26 feet in length and weigh about 12,000 pounds. And females can are between 18 to 22 feet and can weigh 8,000 to 11,000 pounds. They have a pretty long lifespan with females living an average about 50 years in the wild with some individuals being documented to be an estimate of 80 to 100 years of age. Males, Males live on an average of 29 years to a maximum of 50 to 60 years. And another amazing fact about these animals is that they have a very long gestation period of about 15 to 18 months. So there are three different ecotypes of killer whales that can be seen in the Northeastern Pacific. There are actually distinct populations. So what I mean by this is that there are three different ecotypes that all have very different stru family structures and social structures. They do not interbreed with each other and they actually barely even interact. So a very simplistic way to look at it is that resident killer whales eat salmon. They are huge Chinookaholics. They travel in large family uh, families and historically were always present in the Salish Sea from May to October and sporadically throughout the rest of the year. Bigs killer whales are also known as transients. Uh, they have a lot larger of a travel range than the southern residents. They travel in smaller, more immediate family groups, and their main food source is marine mammals. So many bigs uh, in that frequent the Salish Sea regularly like to target seals and sea lions. Um, and then there's also offshore orcas, which are typically seen offshore and appear to mainly eat fish. However, there's a lot less research done on this ecotype compared to the other two. 
So how do we tell the difference between the different ecotypes? In 1970s, a Canadian researcher named Dr. Michael Big and his colleagues were the first ones to determine that killer whales can be identified by their saddle patch and dorsal fin, which are, you can see with these arrows, and that can include any nicks or distinctive scratches along their dorsal fin. The saddle patch is so unique and distinct to each individual whale, it's like a human fingerprint. It can take a lot of time and practice to get good at IDing whales, but a few pointers are to the residents have that rounded tip of dorsal fin, which you can see in the left hand photo, and they also will have a lot of the times that open saddle patch, where transient killer whales do not have that open saddle patch and uh, their dorsal fin slightly more pointed. Now, this type of a photo identification work is extremely important as it's non-invasive and it's a super easy way to determine group size and population numbers. And there's so much more you can learn by simply just by taking a photo of their saddle patch. So how do orcas communicate? So due to the underwater visibility being really low, orcas use sound as their main sense. So with the Southern resident killer whales, they, and old killer whales, they use a biological sonar called echolocation to communicate with each other, navigate, and to find food. With the Southern residents, uh, they send out a high series of uh, high frequency clicks through their bulbous head, and then it listen uh, for the returning echoes, which carries all the information and objects uh, about objects such as size, speed, and location. So essentially when they send out these clicks and they have the returning echoes, it's essentially a 3D picture for them that they get to see. They have various different calls and whistles to communicate with each other, with researchers identifying at least 25 distinct call types with Southern resident killer whales, and they can be heard for miles. Now, bigs and other ecotypes of killer whales use echolocation too. However, with bigs preying on marine mammals that can hear them, they are far less vocal than the southern residents. Southern resident killer whales are a large extended family comprised of JK and L pod. They live in a matrilineal society within, so within each pod, families form into subpods centered around older females, usually the grandmothers and the great grandmothers. The grandmothers are the knowledge holders and they know where the salmon is, the traditional travel routes, and they pass on this information over time to their young ones. Now, both males and females are in close association with their mothers for their entire life. So essentially the males are big mama's boys. However, uh, as of right, uh, as of September 2021, uh, there was only 73 individuals left of this population, which means, and they are both in Canadian and American waters listed as an endangered species. So what are the main threats to the Southern resident killer whales? There are three main distinct threats to the Southern residents and they are prey availability, uh, vessel noise and disturbance and pollutants. So with prey availability, there is a lack of food as so, which is extremely important for their survival. And then vessel noise and disturbance has also been shown to impact not just their communications and their social structure, but has impacted their uh, foraging activity. So how often they will be feeding on food. And then pollutants have also been an extremely harmful uh, aspect to the Southern resident killer whales also. So with this in mind, uh, the next part of the presentation will be focusing on boating around whales in the Salish Sea. This photo right here is an example of what not to do when you see a killer whale. Uh, I took this photo actually from shore, just right by Trial Island. Um, so you can see that there's kayaks, there's a whale watching boat, and there's an orca right in the middle. And there was also three other individuals with this male. So what are the regulations? Uh, the Salish Sea is a transboundary region overseen by the Canada and the US. And therefore there are numerous different regulations to follow based on where you are and what type of whale you are watching. 
This diagram, uh, this diagram on the screen is by B Whalewise, and it kind of gives a clear picture about the different regulations. So I want to emphasize for this section of the presentation, I'll be talking about orcas, but I'll also be talking about how you should boat around other whales too. So when you're watching any type of whale, uh, except for orca, you can approach at a hundred meter distance, unless that whale has a calf or is in a resting position, and then you must watch them at 200 meters. So what I'm saying with this uh, mandatory regulation is that when you're watching a humpback whale, a gray whale, a porpoise, um, you have to stay 100 meters away from that whale unless they have a calf and we're, are resting, and then you have to stay 200 meters away. So because it's really hard to determine, it, is there two whales here? Are they resting? I'm not sure what they're doing. We always recommend that you stay at least 200 meters away from these animals and have a precautionary approach. Now, when watching killer whales, there are a lot different regulations. Uh, so currently there is a mandatory 400 meter viewing distance for killer whales in the Salish Sea, which is highlighted in this map here. The whole orange area is where you must watch whales at 400 meters for killer whales. So what are the risks of getting too close? Uh, the risk of collision can harm you and the whale. So there's all different types of whales you, that can go on a dive and then surface unexpectedly right in front of you. So for example, baleen whales, such as humpback whales, can stay underwater for about 15 to 20 minutes or longer. So just because they went on a dive on the right-hand side of your boat doesn't mean they won't surface literally right in front of you. And in the Salish Sea, there are a lot of whales and commonly seen are orcas, humpbacks, minkies, gray whales, therefore making your risk of collision so much higher in this area. So actually, uh, this past summer, there was a near collision uh, with a humpback whale and a water taxi in Tofino. And the driver was able to put the boat into reverse very quickly and just nearly missed the humpback whale. However, it did startle the whale and the humpback did a tail lob and this tail, the, the whale's tail smashed the glass of the boat and actually uh, left the captain with a bit of an injury. Now, the really fantastic thing about this captain and this uh, company who came out was they came out to educate people that when you're out on the water, even if you're an experienced mariner, you need to pay attention because these animals are big and they can surface unexpectedly. Another example of a collision is actually in 2017 when a whale watching boat uh, hit a humpback whale just outside of Victoria near Race Rocks and two people were actually taken to hospital with severe injuries. And at that point, the captain had been experienced uh, mariner on the water for a long time. So what I'm really trying to emphasize here is this can happen to anyone. And when you're on the water, you need to stay vigilant because also on the photo on the right is the photo of damage boats can do to whales. So this is a humpback whale and uh, it's been cut by a prop of a boat. So it's extremely important to pay attention to what you're doing when you're on the water. So what can you do to reduce the risk of collision? Uh, it's extremely important to be vigilant when you're out on the water. So what you need to do is educate yourself. And a great way to do that is um, look for these signs, which are see a blow, go slow. So when you're out on the water, you should be scanning and always looking for blows of whales. And another thing you can look out for is vessels that who maybe stopped and you don't understand why that boat has stopped. Maybe they're watching whales. So it's good to slow down and proceed with caution. And another thing is you can watch out for this whale warning flag that a lot of vessels fly out on the water when there are whales in the vicinity or people even from shore uh, wave them. So pay attention to these different uh, signs when you're out on the water and just really understand that when you're boating in the Salish Sea, it means that you're in high whale density. So you must be extremely vigilant. Yeah, and I think I'll leave it there. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks for having me and uh, thanks for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's great. Very informative. Just one question before you go. Um, we're, we looked at sort of the Salish Sea, which is around, wraps around the southern tip of Vancouver Island, but how, 
connected are the orcas actually to other ecosystems up and down the coast? How much movement or travel do you see? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it depends on the ecotype of orcas. However, for instance, the southern residents, which we're primarily focusing on in this talk, is they've been seen all the way down in California, and they've been seen all the way up to Alaska. So like you're saying, they are don't just stay in this one particular area. And that is something really important to pay attention to um, and recognize that these animals move. They don't just stay in one uh, small area. They can travel up to about 100 kilometers a day if they felt like it. Wow, that's exceptional. Um, just a question here from uh, one of the attendees. Uh, do these rules apply to uh, canoes or kayaks as well, in addition to motorboats? Yes, they do. Any sort of vessel, and that, thank you for bring, that person for bringing up that question. Uh, so any vessel, which includes a kayak or a canoe, you must stay 400 meters away from orcas in that area from Campbell River around to Euculet. If you were in a kayak or a boat up in Port McNeil, which is on the north end of Vancouver Island, it's a 200 meter approach for any killer whale. Great, thank you. Excellent. Um, can we move on to David? It's good to see you. Yeah, welcome back and um, looking forward to your presentation. Just see you're on mute still and I'm gonna put myself on mute. Thank you, Stephen. You can see my presentation start here. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone who's joining here today with the Royal British Columbia Museum World Whale Day presentation. Hi, Chika, thank you. My name is Samat. I'm from the Songhees Nation, also known as David Dick. I work with the Wasenich Leadership Council as the Southern Resident Killer Whale Senior Manager here on the Sartlip First Nations Reserve. The Wasenich Leadership Council is in the beginning stages of creating the Southern Resident Killer Whale Monitoring Program. The Wasenich Marine Guardian, also known as the Quintalian, is to revive a new beginning of monitoring, which our ancestors did throughout the Salish Sea since time immemorial. The Southern Resident Killer Whale Program is a multi-year initiative. This program will restore the balance between the Wasenich and the Catholomachin, also known as the Killer Whales, and have our Wasenich people out on the water to see that our Wasenich sacred responsibilities are upheld. So my second slide here, I'm gonna share some words um, before I go into detail regarding our Southern Resident Killer Whale Program. And I wanna share a quote from an elder here in the Sartlip community that has resonated with me since the first time I heard him talk in front of the National Energy Board in November 2018. And I would like to ask that everyone that's online and bear with me for a moment as I share his words. And then that I feel that it's helped me shape the direction of our program's foundation so far. Elder Sampson that you see here in, in the presentation, he stood in front of the Energy Board at the TMX hearing and began with a grieving song at this meeting and that passed on to him from his grandmother and offered it to Tahoeen and her baby. And for those of you who don't know who Tahoeen is, she was the killer whale that became famous around the world where she carried her dead calf around for 17 days. And what he said has really stuck to with me since the first time I heard it. And I'll just read it and then we'll go from there with the rest of my presentation. He said, and he con concluded by showing a photo of the mother clinging to the dead calf and the one that you see in the presentation. He says, the whale is just not a whale. This is our child. This is our relative. Even though in English, they say she is a killer whale, she is not. She is a mother. She cried for her child because it needed to show the world that something is wrong with what we are doing as people. It is not about politics. It is about who we are in our relationship with the ocean 
in the land that we live in. And so this has really stuck with me, what he said. And we as First Nations people share a common goal in wanting to protect and monitor the Southern resident killer whales and all the other beings around. So begins our Quintalian Wasanich Marine Guardian program. And for our program here, we have a vision. And there's four key areas that we're interested in, is to ensure the Southern resident killer whale have access to prey, evaluate marine impacts and monitoring vessel activities around the Southern resident killer whale, collaborate with like-minded allies who also are working to protect the Southern resident killer whale, and to restore the relationship of the whales and the Wasanich people through increasing understanding of the whales. So there's four critical components that our Quintalian, the Wasanich Marine Guardian will be working on. The first one is habitat monitoring. Next one is baseline monitoring, compliance monitoring, and a cultural component. So the first one, the habitat monitoring, is to monitor the salmon population's abundance and health and environmental factors and so on. And so what, what we're going to be doing is look at salmon stream monitoring, salmon habitat estuary enhancement, herring monitoring enhancement. And what we'd like to do is collaborate, like I mentioned earlier, with like-minded people like the Goldstream Volunteer Salmon or Enhancement Society and expand our scope of activities. For example, with the Royal BC Museum, who were here today sharing our information about what the West Sandwich Leadership um, Council's Guardian Program will be doing. And with the salmon habitat, we want to review and monitor the effects of the main channels of the habitation and look at the removal of invasive species and help with educating the public. And lastly, we're, we want to deploy, if possible, is um, herring spawning nets in our traditional territory and emphasize on the spawning areas that we used to have a long time ago. The next area that we're going to be working on is a baseline monitoring. And here we want to monitor the marine mammals and the resource ex, um, extractions from the industry, such as from recreational commercial fisheries. And, uh, and so what we're going to be doing is do some research on sea mammal population, salmon extraction from sports and commercial fisheries. And so what we want to do is look at the relationships between the different species populations. So the impact seals and sea lion populations have on the salmon population and then do on water monitoring on both the sports and commercial fisheries actual catch so that way we get a better understanding. The third area that we're that we're going to be doing is monitor large and small vessels in key SRKW areas, high vessel density areas to have a better understanding of the stressors on the southern resident killer whales. And look, what we're going to be doing is going to do some on-water monitoring and land-based monitoring. And what we're going to be doing is we want to monitor the whale watching industry along with other small vessels through visual monitoring and documentation. And then as for the land-based monitoring, what we're looking to do have land-based cameras and hydrophones that can be deployed in specific areas. For the cultural component, what we're looking to do is create an understanding by sharing stories and provide opportunities for our community members to learn more about the relationships with our relatives of the deep. And how we're going to do that is that we're going to gather stories from our knowledge holders look at offering field trips and incorporate our West Sandwich laws. And how we're gonna do all these is that we're looking to develop educational materials using the Sanchathan language uh, that describes 
the Kothala machine, which is their killer whales. And look at um, possible field trips, like to the Royal BC Museum Orca Display, possible visits out to uh, Saturna Island, to East Point, which is in the Gulf Islands National Park Reserve, where they have a whale trail there. And then lastly, look to incorporate ways of protecting our protectors of the sea, along with sharing the knowledge. And lastly, in closing, um, I want to say our program is to adequately support our specific needs as the Wasanish people by developing a governance structure, structure and establish a tailored program that increases the Wasanish presence in the Salish Sea. Furthermore, our guardian program will be a tool for our communities to gather the necessary information using both Wasenis knowledge and Western science to become more informed about the activities and the long-term cumulative effects that affect not only the Southern resident killer whales, but all associate species within the ecosystem. The Wasenich people are the original stewards of the lands and waters throughout the Wasenich territory and have been gifted of the knowledge of how to be in good relationships with our relatives of the deep. As Quintalians, the Wasenich Marine Guardians, we will strive to maintain a balance between human use and the needs of the natural world by living healthy lives with our Catholicism, also known as the killer whales. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks so much, David. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you, or if you could remind me of, um, uh, correct me if I say it incorrectly, the program name is Quantalian. Um, how, what is the meaning of that word? The Quantalian it derives from three different words. And one of my goals when I first started was that I wanted something that signifies the Wasanish people using the Sinchatham language and something that gives meaning. So as you see in my clothing here, we have a symbol, which is a sea wolf. It's a, it's a wolf transferring into a killer whale. And so it's about identification. So when you're asking about what does Quintalia mean, Quinn means watch out to sea. Tall means out at sea. And yin derives from the word reef net captain, which is related to the reef net captain. And so I had conversations with our, our Wasenich language committee and I asked our elders and I explained it to them. I said, I want something that signifies who we are as Wasenich people. And so that there's an identity so people can recognize and they can see it and they said, oh, there's a Wasenich people. There's the, the Wasanish Marine Guardians. And so it was really important for me to do something like that, that really signifies who we are as First Nations people. Awesome. Yeah. And, and um, I just have one last question, maybe about youth in your communities and how you see um, this, this um, program and, and your efforts being uh, carried on or picked up and, and learned um, by future generations. I'm hoping to, with the different areas of interest that we're going to be doing with our monitoring program, for example, I'll, I'll talk about hydrophones. We're looking to work with the BC Whale Organization to set up a hydrophone in a key area where the Southern Resident Killer Whale Transit. And I won't share where that is at the moment, but I will down the road at some time if we ever have another talk is that I wanna give our children and our youth the ability to hear the voices of our relatives of the deep. And then look at it, some kind of learning aspect where students gain credits for going out to the hydrophone areas and help doing uh, work with monitoring. So either by taking photos of whales going by or other things that are going by. And so that way they earn credit for their diploma to get their dog with diploma or whatever it may be. And so th that's the bigger scope of me. And so 
of their whole program with our guardians is that it's not just going to be about our team here that we're just developing. It's about our community, about getting them involved and giving them an opportunity for our future. Fantastic. Yeah. And I, I just see one question from an attendee here too, um, that's looking or wondering if you have any information about volunteering for some of the monitoring or other project work that you have. So how can people sort of support or volunteer those efforts for those efforts? Well, I think I thank that person for asking that, you know, uh, since I've started and with our information coming up on our web page, I've been actually been getting a flood of calls and people interested to help to volunteer and they want to work with us. At the moment, uh, we don't have anything in place to work with volunteers at the moment. Right now, like I said, we're in our beginning stages of with our program. Uh, I am working with the University of Victoria with a student that has interest in working with us towards his uh, master's degree and in a field of interest that we're interested in what we're doing. And so those who are interested, I encourage you to go to our West Saanich Leadership Council's um, webpage and you see it up here where it says westsaanich.com for updates and the information, um, what we're doing, and especially with our Quintalian, our Wasanich Marine Guardians. There's been several posts. There's an introduction of myself. Uh, there's an introduction done by Maui. There's some background information about our logo and our name and background information about our program for those who are really keen and interested to find out more. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for joining us here. Um, Pre-recorded a couple days before World, World Whale Day on the 20th um, here at Royal BC Museum. Very uh, grateful to have an opportunity to speak with um, David Dick and Molly Fraser. And uh, please, yes, um, more information um, about the importance of Southern resident killer whales in our communities in the Salish Sea. Um, and check out more about their programming on their website, um, all listed in our chat. We thank you again. We say hi for joining us, David, and uh, we look forward to being in touch real soon. Thank you very much, everybody, and stay safe and happy World Day. And for everybody that is joining us, please feel free to contact us through our website, and hopefully we can answer your questions. Um, thank you very much, hi See you.